Many people know that on Halo 3's Longshore, there's an easter egg that has a fish logo that slowly changes over the course of a match. This fish is known as Franck, and has thought to have been a nod to franchise director Frank O'Connor because of the play on the name. It's not uncommon across Halo to see developer references throughout any Halo game. However, the time frame of Longshore's release and the massive changes coming to Halo during this specific time in Halo history and into the future has led some fans to wonder if this easter egg based on Frank O'Connor was put into the game more as an insult rather than an homage. You see, in 2008, Frank O'Connor did something very unprecedented when it comes to the gaming industry. Frank O'Connor was a community manager at Bungie with some content writing under his belt, and in 2008, he would be handpicked by then Microsoft exec Bonnie Ross to become the franchise development director for the future of the entire Halo series and to help form what would become 343 Industries. And while Frank O'Connor would still continue to work alongside the Halo team, he no longer was a part of Bungie and would go on to begin laying down the groundwork for where Halo would go after Bungie would depart. Now, like we said earlier, an homage to a developer appearing in a Halo game is not unusual. However, Frank O'Connor left in May of 2008, and Longshore released alongside Halo 3 ODST in September of 2009, a Frank O'Connor Easter egg well over a year and four months after he had already left Bungie. Tie this Easter egg into some other little interesting things that pop up on the map, like this text that says, Suck it, Frank, has made some people maybe raise an eyebrow at what the true purpose was of this Easter egg. We do know that towards the end of Halo 3's development, Frank O'Connor played a big role in making the decision to make the humans and Forerunners separate species. It wasn't solely his discretion, but he started planting the seeds for this in the terminals and in the promotional materials for Halo 3. Tie these changes along with his new massive promotion that he received at the time. There is a possibility it led to some of the people remaining at Bungie who had worked on the Halo franchise for nearly 10 years to maybe feel, I don't know, maybe slightly salty. Either way, this could be a very clever inside joke at Frank O'Connor's expense. So to this day, the mystery remains. Was this a nice, respectful, and funny homage to Frank O'Connor, or was it maybe just a little funny jab they threw in there as well? Or does this have nothing to do with Frank O'Connor? Unless a Bungie employee decides to talk about it directly, this mystery remains. Now, in this video, we have some other really interesting mysteries that take things to a whole nother level, so we're gonna get right into that. But first, this video is sponsored by Displate, and when we found out we got to work with Displate, we were so hyped. Displate makes these incredible magnetic metal posters that are so much more high quality than a standard poster and have some of the highest quality and coolest designs available for whatever you need to bring your wall decorations up to the next level. Like for instance, we are like, hey, we like Halo. Boom. They sent us all of these Halo posters? Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3. Luke even found the perfect spot for Halo 4 in his house. The best thing about Display is how easy it is to set up. You just stick the magnet right here and boom, it's on the wall. It literally takes like 20 seconds. As you guys know, I'm a massive Animal Crossing fan, so I got this really big one that is an amazing design and it mixes like that Japanese architecture, art direction with Animal Crossing, which I love. Not only did they send me a ton of cool posters, they sent Luke these and they also sent our other editor, Sauce, these. If you use that link down below, you will get some sweet discounts. We picked out a ton of poster designs and prints that we thought that you guys would like based on the stuff that we're interested in. So you guys can just look around down below. Also, if you end up buying something, send us a tweet on Twitter. Here's our Twitter handles. We'd love to see what you guys end up getting. Personally, I'm using our own discount link to buy more displays with. All right, let's go ahead and jump back into the video. Well, what a cool sponsor. Marty O'Donnell definitely has been vocal on Twitter about a lot of interesting points in Halo, sharing a ton of stories and facts and details about the development of Halo that nobody ever had known about. However, one really interesting thing that Marty O'Donnell has tweeted about in the past, which we've talked about on this channel, but we've never been able to find any answers to, is the fact that in Halo Reach, the Covenant language does have some sort of either translation or form to it. And Marty said this in a tweet, as you can see on the screen, it shows that there is kind of some intentional stuff done with the linguistics side of the game that would have given the Covenant's language a whole lot more depth than maybe what we had seen originally in Halo Combat Evolved, where some of the lines are just human dialogue 
dialogue reversed and slowed down. So it is interesting that in Reach, there was a ton of attention to detail made into actually building out a language for the Covenant, though we have no idea what this is and how the language even works. And from the way that the tweet is kind of phrased, it suggests that there is a solution and that it's possible that fans could figure it out one day. I don't know if that's just Marty kind of leading people on or there is something really interesting hidden there. What's the deal with this door on the storm? It opens and operates, but it's never actually used in the game. How does Cortana in Halo 3 communicate with Master Chief with those little pop-up ad messages that she sends? Did she leave these messages behind before she was left behind on High Charity? Is she communicating wirelessly? And why is she choosing these specific messages that she says in these pop-ups to guide Master Chief along his way. We understand the storytelling purposes of these, but what are the logistics behind it? How does this actually work? We did a whole video on Halo vehicle speeds. However, we talked about how in Halo 2, we can't actually measure any units because nowhere in the game is there any tools that you can measure distances in game. So we can't translate like in-game units to a real world measurement like meters. Yeah, we were surprised too. The sniper doesn't have any measuring things. None of the vehicles or game types have it and none of the waypoints have them either. Some of the keypads in Halo Infinite's multiplayer, if you punch them, they'll react in shock or something, and then some of them don't do anything at all. Why are they different? Okay, this next one will likely one day get solved as the campaign eventually will get more information and move along in general with the narrative overall. But as far as majority of the rest of the Halo characters in the universe, we have no idea what the state of them are and if many of them are alive. So far we know many characters were on the Infinity, last we had checked, like a lot of the Elites and the Arbiter, we have Osiris, even Virgil was on board. We know a lot of people died on the Infinity based off of this little opening cutscene, but is it gonna end up being one of those things where when they reveal characters later on, all of our favorite characters just happen to survive? Or are we gonna learn that some of these characters did in fact bite the dust off screen and we're just gonna have to live with that being the conclusion to those characters. Is there a deeper meaning to these symbols that show up in Halo Reach's campaign and are they connected to these marathon symbols? Also, what's the deal with all of the bird references on this multiplayer level in Halo Infinite? I mean, we have a bird here, we have some birds over here, uh, some references to birds here as well. I mean, this level just has birds everywhere you look. Speaking of birds, why are there seagulls on high charity? Like, how did they get there? Why, why, why do these human birds already exist on a Covenant spaceship? And why are they flying up here where you can see them in the level? Also, while we're at it, whatever happened to the Halo 2 Spectre? This vehicle was really cool. It was used by the Covenant in some instances and then just disappeared from the battlefield. We never saw this vehicle ever show up in any scenario or situation ever again. It's a little odd that like a vehicle would be used so heavily and then just never be used ever again. Even if like the brutes took over and replaced them with prowlers. I don't know. I just feel like we need to see the Spectre return someday or another. One of the biggest rumors of all time was Halo for the Nintendo DS. So many people were hopeful and excited and it never really was announced or supposed to be a thing. There was this IGN video that caused a ton of questions that was already at the time showing off that the game wasn't going to release but was showing this playable beta demo and to this day there's still speculation as to who even made this demo. There hasn't been an official dump of this DS game or prototype out there, so there's no way of actually fully knowing how far along this prototype was built, what is all on the cartridge. We see Zanzibar and like an SMG and that's cool, and there's speculation that this was built on the GoldenEye engine for Rogue Agent or something like that for the DS. Yeah, a ton of massive question marks still surrounding this thing to this day. One of the biggest tragedies in the Halo trilogy that not too many know about is the lost cat Jonesy. This is a nod to the Alien franchise, but also an interesting joke that has kind of continued throughout the Halo franchise and to this day we still don't know was the cat Jonesy ever found. We get this missing poster sign in Halo Combat Evolved and that was a funny joke for a while but in Halo 3 there was a couple of posters that made their way into the game that read still missing my cat Jonesy and that's pretty clever so we know at least as of Halo 3 nobody found this missing cat Jonesy but someone out there in the Halo universe is still looking for their cat putting posters up. In Combat Evolved Anniversary you would think Jonesy maybe got found because of the poster it said found cat but it's just a picture of a possum so 
Where is Jonesy? We still don't know. Okay, we've done plenty of searches into the big mystery on sand traps. We won't dive into that again in this video, especially because it looks like there might be some sort of answers starting to come up from little things that popped up in Halo Infinite. But one thing we did notice when we were looking for answers and analyzing this mystery originally is that there's some smaller mysteries that still haven't fully been resolved that kind of pop up on similar maps that have the big sand trap glyphs that everyone wonders about. Like for instance, on Epitaph, not only are the inscriptions from Sand Trap also here, but there's these interesting holograms. And if you look at them, it almost looks like based on the shapes of the object that they are numbered. And if you go to the map Guardian, you also can see the same thing. These holographic symbols that are countered with different amounts of items on them. See, look, one, two, three, four. You, you see where I'm trying to kind of count these? The interesting thing is you can stand in them and they actually are interactive as when you walk through them, they kind of like dissipate and then they'll come back together, which made us think that maybe if you stood in them in a certain order, you could count up, but it doesn't look like there's anything necessarily that we can see to these, but we can't help but to wonder what the original design philosophy was, if it was put there just to make people wonder, and that's a very fair choice with knowing how Bungie usually operates with these types of things, but still, it was worth kind of raising an eyebrow to. There's a couple of mysteries that still exist relating to different Halo skulls that never have been answered fully. Firstly, we know that there's this weird discrepancy with the fog skull across Halo games. In Halo 3, when the skull was first introduced, it was called the fog skull. Then in Halo 3 ODST, it wasn't in the game. And Halo Reach, it was renamed to Cloud for some reason, okay? No big deal. In Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary, it was renamed back to fog skull. In Halo 4, it was renamed back to cloud skull. And in Halo Reach on the Master Chief Collection, while it says Cloud Skull, it has been renamed again to the Fog Skull. We've made a whole video on this. Still, there's no real answers. We have some speculation and ideas of what's going on here, but we really don't know too much as to why this has been renamed so often. Okay, there's documentation online all over the place that in Halo 2 Vista, there is an extra skull on the level Regret that you can only find on Legendary Difficulty. However, there's no documentation as far as video evidence of this existing. I've went on Halo 2 Vista on Legendary Difficulty looking for this skull and I haven't been able to find it. I don't know if there actually is this extra mystery skull in Halo 2 Vista that has been so widely spread online, but if any of you ever find it, please do let me know. In the original Halo 3, there was this extra skull that people found on Cortana, and while there isn't an achievement or anything associated with it, some people suspect that it lets you do something weird with weapon carryover. There's still something weird about the skull. It doesn't interact in the same way the other skulls do, so a little backstory as to why this skull actually exists and what it would actually do would be a really cool thing to find out. Okay, over in Halo Combat Evolved, when this game released, Sergeant Johnson definitely wasn't a major character. He kind of was just like a higher rank regular Marine amongst the rest of the UNSC that would battle on the ground. So they didn't really overthink like where this character would be and how this character would evolve into a much more prominent character by the time Halo 2 would come around. And because of that, there's a lot of discrepancies with this character and his timeline during Halo Combat Evolved evolved. Sometimes he's here when technically he's supposed to be over here. It's kind of like, how is he fighting here on Assault in the Control Room when just hours earlier he was supposed to be lost on Guilty Spark, right? There's a few other things that are a little weird about Sergeant Johnson in general, which has led fans to come up with this like clone theory that Sergeant Johnson was like the perfected version of the Flash clone and there's a ton of Sergeant Johnsons out there. I kind of like this theory because it does interestingly fill in a lot of the little plot holes that aren't that big of a deal. Like if he's here in Halo 3's ending, dying, how is he in this little Easter egg in Halo 4? There's also some timeline issues with Halo 3 ODST, I think, where Sergeant Johnson would have had to like haul butt from like one end of the galaxy to the other in between Halo 2, 3 ODST, and 3 again, if he was supposed to be there in time to interrogate Virgil at the end of ODST. Nonetheless, it would be interesting if they did just go all in on some sort of weird explanation like this. They maybe shouldn't. Maybe they should. But it would be interesting nonetheless because it is something that still to this day some fans try to wrap their head around. Okay, I can confidently say that when it came to Halo 3 ODST, I think that we have a pretty good understanding as to what the glyphs ended up meaning. We did a whole three-part series on the mystery of the glyphs, our findings, and then kind of our big conclusion that we did get confirmation we were right on. However, this though we did solve the glyphs overall, it doesn't solve the other part of one of the early mysteries in ODST, which were what these J signs meant. There were three different versions of them. They had these dots. Of course, people thought they were Braille 
real. Some people thought there were Morse code. Some people thought there were Morris code, which I don't think is a thing. There's all types of theories as to what these could be, but to this day, there hasn't been a solution as to what this is. It could be nothing at all, but maybe there's a secret message hidden in there if we could figure out how to transcode it. But yeah, we still don't know anything about what these symbols actually mean. So as you guys know, the Blam engine is the engine that's existed for all of Halo. From Comet Evolved all the way through Halo Infinite, the same engine has essentially been the core of what runs Halo. However, after the development of Halo Combat Evolved, there were plans for what Bungie was going to be doing next, and originally it wasn't Halo 2. There were plans to work on several different game franchises using that Blam engine, but none of these games came into fruition, and very little is actually known about these cancelled games. Though, many people to this day still wonder what would have become and what type of game Bungie would have made had Halo Combat Evolved not been as successful as it was leading into Microsoft wanting Bungie to continue to make Halo for the foreseeable future at the time. So far, there's very little known. However, there was a game that was planned to immediately have the team shift over to begin work on after Combat Evolved released, but obviously that changed when the game ended up being a huge success, which was called Phoenix. Not much is known about the game, though it seems like there were a couple of developers at Bungie, senior developers, who were pretty heavily involved in it for a while. However, when Halo Combat Evolved was hitting the later stages of its development, the team had to pivot off of Phoenix to help focus on Combat Evolved shipping on time. And then after CE shipped, they went right back to Phoenix, though it still seemed like the game wasn't quite in a state where Bungie was 100% sure they wanted to follow through with it. There was some, and ultimately this game ended up getting discontinued. There was apparently another game that was led by Hardy LaBelle, which ended up getting canceled during the same time, which had the code name Monster Hunter, not to be confused with the popular Monster Hunter series, though we still don't know much about that game either. During the earlier stages of development of Halo 2, another game title known as Gypsum was being worked on, which apparently was a free roam third person action beat em up game that mixed mythology and fantasy. They had music by Martin O'Donnell in it. Designer Paul Bertone compared the game to more modern titles like The Witcher 3 or Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, and it seems like this game ended up getting cancelled in 2003 due to major issues in Halo 2's development that required Bungie to reallocate where the team was working on, and unfortunately this game ended up falling victim to that. Not all would be lost though, the Blam engine would get to see a tiny bit of action outside of the Halo franchise. It would go on to see the release of Stubbs the Zombie, and later on a prototype for Shadowrun was built using the Blam engine, though that version of the game would never release and the game would be built from the ground up in a different engine. There also was a prototype for a game called Hail the Chimp that was built off of the Stubbs the Zombie split of the Blam engine. Another interesting thing is that after Halo 3's development, Bungie split up into teams to work on different engines, and as part of the team was working on the engine that eventually would be used for Destiny 1, there was an overlap period after Halo Reach released where Bungie developers couldn't use the new engine just yet, but they wanted to start working on early production for Destiny, so they used the Halo Reach engine that they were familiar with working on to prototype a lot of things, knowing that all of that stuff would have to be thrown out and redone in the new engine. So the real question is, while there is limited footage out there of this early, early build of Destiny in the Halo Reach engine, we would love to know how far along this build actually got and what else is technically out there in some dev kit maybe somewhere. It is really cool to see something like a Halo animation being reused in like an early Destiny prototype here, but how far did this prototype go? It looks like there was a substantial amount of work done, and we did a whole video diving into this topic as well, that there was quite a bit actually done in this stage, even getting some parts of raids working in this old build. So we would love to see how much and to what extent Destiny was prototyped in this old Halo Reach engine before moving on to the main engine that it would be built in. For a really long time, Halo 2 has also been a very interesting and contentious point of a big mystery surrounding the version of Halo 2 that was supposed to release, but never actually did. As many people already know, Halo 2 during its development was under a very, very tight time frame, and a lot of things that were originally planned for the game ended up getting cut. The most notable example of this is that old E3 demo from 2003, which shows very different gameplay than anything that we actually saw in the game. 
game. This entire level or version of the level ended up getting scrapped. Now the interesting thing is we actually covered this in a, like our lost media video, but since the release of that video, 343 announced that they were working alongside a dig site team that is like a group of modders in the community that are working on restoring some cut content from the older Halo games. That's incredibly exciting. They've even shown off a little bit of the gameplay demo that's been stitched back together that will perhaps eventually be playable to the player base one day. That's all great and stuff. However, we do still have a little bit of a curiosity around what the actual plans of these levels would have been. This is an interpretation based on things that are left over in the games and are available. I have seen various times where members of the dig site team that are working on restoring this content, reaching out on Twitter to try to get a hold of original developers to try to get insight on how to recreate some of the intentional things. And I feel like if they don't already have that information going into trying to restore content, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to capture the same exact idea that was originally intended. But still, being able to explore ideas that never fully made their way into the Halo games is exciting. I think there will always be the mystery as to what the intention of the level would have been like and what the level would have actually played like had the original core team back in the day actually developed it. When 3 for 3 announced this project, it definitely sounded way more official, but seeing some of the observations along the way, I am curious on the methodology of how the restoration is going in place and what differentiates this from, say, like a fan-made mod inspired by cut content versus a strict restoration of cut content. But still, there's a lot of mysteries around that original Halo 2 planned version that still to this day, there's a lot of things completely unanswered out there. For instance, if you listen to the director's commentary for Halo 2, where you hear Joseph Staten, Marty O'Donnell, Jason Jones, and others talk about Halo 2, it's really interesting, but you learn a lot about stuff that did not quite make its way to the game. Not only was there a whole final act and all this other stuff, there were full levels that were conceived and just completely thrown away, like this Forerunner boat level that it seemed like even the people in the commentary didn't know much about. And so what was the idea? It was supposed to be an interesting level, at least from what Jason Jones said, so we still know nothing really about it. Well, I think Elijah forgot to record an outro, or I couldn't find the outro in any of the audio files, so I'm just gonna thank our patrons for all the support. We couldn't do it without you. You're an amazing help. Make sure you check out the sponsor Displayed. They have amazing artworks, and they look cool on your wall. And that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. Next video will be our April Fool's video, so you guys got something to look forward to.